you so much for coming. Um, this is Jen. I'm Chris Alstrom. I'm the executive director of Eco Action Partners and a long time resident and slightly crazy high altitude. We're so excited to have the opportunity to bring Penny to our regional community. It's a collaborative effort with the Wilkinson Public Library and the culmination of the Building Common Ground series, which was funded by the American Library Association and the Fetzer Institute. So we're continuing our collaboration with the library and we'll be bringing you more opportunities to gather, learn, and hopefully act um, throughout the year. And we'll be bringing a new endeavor uh, called Elevated Thinking to, to you in 2014, right after now. So we will be hearing more about that. So we thank the Building Common Ground plan tours, our wonderful five-star library staff, Steve Scott and Barbara both here, and they've been instrumental in helping put this together. And Local sponsors, including Alpine Bank, as well as our local media, the Daily Planner for Watch, Kogo, and Tell Your Right Inside and Out. So Kenny Osbell is an award-winning social entrepreneur, author, journalist, and filmmaker. He's the founder and co-CEO of Bioneers, an internationally recognized nonprofit dedicated to disseminating breakthrough solutions for restoring people and planet. He launched the annual Bioneers Conference in 1990 with his business partner and wealthy wife, Nina Simons. She's also so she's co-founder and co-CEO. Kenny also co-founded the national company Seeds of Change in 1989 and served as CEO until 1994. That was to uh, restore backyard biodiversity uh, into the food web through marketing organic and heirloom seeds across the across the nation. Really, Kenny's also a writer, filmmaker, and a media professional executive producer and co-writer of the award-winning international radio series Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature, which I believe plays on Kodo as well as other local radio stations. He acted as a central advisor to Leonardo DiCaprio's feature documentary, The Eleventh Hour, which is also really good, I believe they have that at the library, and appears in the film. He's written four books, and we will have a book signing right after this over at Between the Covers, so please join us there. And he's edited several volumes of the Bioneers book series. His most recent book is Dreaming the Future, Reimagining Civilization in the Age of Nature. And thanks to those in the audience who came and participated in our book club that we finished up right before he came. So the next book will take a little longer, but this one's like, hey, he's coming. We've got to read this book right now. So thanks, everybody. He uh, writes for the Huffington Post and his critically acclaimed film, Hoxie, When Healing Becomes a Crime, and related reporting were named for the best censored stories award for investigative journalism. The film played in movie theaters and aired on uh, HBO and international TV and enjoyed a special screening for members of Congress at the Kennedy Center, reported on NPR, and is available at our local library. So we are delighted to have him here to speak and engage. Uh, these are interactive, so we uh, hope you are, came prepared to engage and not just listen. Um, so that's tonight, and then tomorrow morning, another opportunity at the Palm, starting at 8.30. We're going to have a couple of classes come in at 9. So again, another opportunity for us to not only talk about what he has experienced in, but what we need to do and want to do for you. And then, if you get one more time, in Ridgeway at 7 tomorrow night um, at the Sherbourne Miller Theater. So um, it's all about how we dream and create our own thriving and resilient future. So please join me in welcoming Ken Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. I love Telluride, and it's really great to be back here. Um, let me just grab a sip of water. Um, I'd really like to thank Chris and Scott and um, the core node or pod of people we have here in Telluride who are real Bioneers champions and Bioneers here in Telluride, so um, much appreciated. And uh, just so you know, it's sort of blinding with this light and it's always a little disorienting because I wish I could see you better, so I'm kind of talking into the void here, but I'll do the best I can. Um, and I really want to send greetings on behalf of Nina also who is very much the co-creator of Bioneers and a you know, deep um, partner in, in all of this work. And so she looks forward to also being able to come up here and, and do this sometime as well. So um, what I was thinking is this, is that um, I have a few written prepared remarks that I thought I might get into that's probably 15 or 20 minutes, something like that. 
And then I thought I'd just speak a little bit extemporaneously about the reason and the purpose that I'm actually here in Telluride, um, which is around building resilient communities and a, a, a network of resilient communities around the country. I'm um, gonna just give you a little bit of context for that. And then what I'd really like to do is open it up just for questions and conversation. And you know, a friend of mine once said, you never learn anything with your mouth open. And so I'm more interested in what you think. I know what I think. So um, I, I'm kind of here to learn, actually. Um, so does that sound like a good menu to people? OK. Um, and I managed to somehow bring the wrong draft of my written remarks, which is a longer draft. So I'm really paranoid that I'm going to go into more detail than you probably want, because I get kind of obsessed with this stuff. But um, hopefully, I'll hold your attention that long. <laughs> so. Um, and again, really thank you for coming. I know, you know time is precious to all of us, and showing up is, is a big deal, so thank you. In this epic moment of radical, environmental, uh, of radical environmental and social disruption, the world is experiencing the dawn of a revolutionary transformation to an ecologically literate and socially just civilization. We're learning the hard way that when you fight nature, you lose. We're learning that what we do to each other, we do to the earth. The existential gauntlet is to make the shift fast enough to outrun global cataclysm. The next five or six years will be the once in a civilization window to change course. We can move from breakdown to breakthrough. The Mayan people call this epic moment the time of no time. From here on, we're on Earth time. Mother Earth is shaking to her core. It's a time of madness, disconnection, and hyper-individualism. It's also a time when new energies are coming into the world when people are growing a new skin. The Mayan vision says we in the West will find safe harbor only if we can journey past a wall of mirrors. The mirrors will drive us mad unless we have a strong heart. Some mirrors delude us with an infinity of reflections of our vanity and our shadows. Others paralyze us with our terror and rage, feeding an empire that manufactures our fear into resignation. But the empire has no roots and it's toppling all around us. In this time, everyone is called to take a stand. Everyone is called to be a leader. To get beyond the wall of mirrors, the final challenge is to pass through a tiny door. To do this, we must make ourselves very, very small, to be very humble. Then we must burrow down into the earth where indigenous consciousness lives. On the other side is a clear pond. There, for the first time, we'll, see, we'll be able to see our true reflection. In this time of no time, we can go in any direction we want by dreaming it. Our dreaming can shift the course of the world. Paradoxically, so that is actually from the Mayan people, by the way. Um, we have a direct line to some of the folks there, and that's really what the prophecy is about, essentially. Paradoxically, the crisis confronting us today is precisely the dream of our current civilization. The dream of endless growth, hyper-individualism, hyper and domination has turned into a nightmare. How do we dream our way out of a nightmare? One way is to wake up. All over the world, people are awakening to a new dream. We're reimagining a civilization in the age of nature that honors the web of life, each other, and future generations. It's a revolution from the heart of nature. For decades, brilliant scientific and social innovators such as the Bioneers have patiently been creating the shadow systems for how we live on Earth and with each other for the long haul. For the most part, the solutions are present, or we certainly know what directions to head in. It's not that we need more solutions. We need to rapidly spread and scale what we've already got. We need to mobilize at a scale that we've only previously done in times of war. It's emergence in an emergency. As the talking head sang, this ain't no party, this ain't no disco, this ain't no fooling around. In 2012, two rude awakenings are causing shockwaves, have caused shockwaves while simultaneously releasing the floodgates of transformation. The first is the onset of conspicuous climate disruption. The second is the stranglehold of the greatest extremes of wealth ever seen in human civilization. They're not unrelated. As Bill McKibben points out, scientists have underestimated the speed and scale of early climate disruption. Even if, uh, even if we stop pumping carbon into the atmosphere right now, what we've already done will raise the temperature by another 0.8 degrees Celsius. But we're not stopping. We're putting record amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere, and at this rate, in 16 years, the planet will be uninhabitable. 
Meanwhile, the major oil corporations hold reserves five times higher than the amounts of carbon we can burn in order to keep below the hopefully safe threshold of two degrees Celsius of warming. They're planning to burn it all, and their market valuations are based on the valuation of those reserves. As McKibben warns, rapid transformative change is the only way out. Picture the civil rights movement in fast forward. Key to that transformation is stopping the fossil fuel oligarchs before they poach the planet. As the International Forum on Globalization um, observes in its excellent report, which I highly recommend, called Outing the Oligarchy, today's single biggest threat to our global climate commons is, the, commons is the group of billionaires who profit most from its pollution and in turn push government policies that promote more fossil fuels. Globalization has triggered a tectonic shift of wealth and political power upward to a group of multi-billionaires. According to Jeffrey Winters, the author of Oligarchy, wealth in the US today is two times as concentrated as Imperial Rome, which was a slave and farmer society, right? The 400 richest people have more wealth than the so-called, quote, bottom 185 million people. <laughs> According to the CIA, the US is a more unequal society than Egypt or Tunisia. Um, meanwhile, the too-big-to-fail banks have gamed the system at breathtaking heights. Call it bottom-down and top-up, breadcrumbs and circuses. As the Nobel laureate Joseph, economist Joseph Stiglitz points out, more equal societies are better for everyone, including the wealthy. Jeremy Grantham, the far-seeing chairman of the $100 billion um, GMO capital fund, says humanity's vexed relationship with the planet is the great economic story of our time. He says that global warming will be the most important investment issue for the, seeable, for the foreseeable future. And he says, quote, if we maintain our desperate focus on growth, we'll run out of everything and crash, peak everything else. That's the nub, boom and doom, the final throes of an oligarchic economic system bedeviled by its original sin of unlimited growth on a finite planet. Nature does not favor centralization because one shock can crash the whole system all at once. Climate change, compounded by the concentration of wealth and distribution of poverty, is pushing natural and human systems to a perfect storm of tipping points. The key is to build resilience um, from the ground up to enhance our ability to avoid system-wide collapse and transform to adapt to dramatic change that's inevitable. It means a radical decentralization of our infrastructure, energy and food systems. Um, it means a greater devolution of political power to local and regional levels. It means democratizing, democratizing wealth and access to capital. It means democratizing democracy. And it's doable based largely on what we already know. Um, and this is into Bioneer's world without going into any detail, but using off-the-shelf technologies, we can radically increase energy conservation and rapidly ramp up distributed renewable energy. We know how to feed the world using ecological agriculture that sequesters carbon, restores natural capital, and builds local economies. We're rapidly learning how to mimic nature's designs and recipes with green chemistry, cradle-to-cradle -cradle industry, living buildings, and smart growth. We can conserve and use water wisely. We're reinventing finance as well as governance, instituting rights for nature, and revoking corporate constitutional rights. Um, I'm going to skip over a little bit here. Nature is also getting respect from the vanguard of the banking industry as nature becomes the model and mentor and teacher. Um, as an ecology, too much complexity breeds instability. The Bank of England and others are studying ecological networks and disease patterns to understand how nature avoids cataclysmic systemic shocks. The big banks correspond to models of infectious disease contagions caused by what are called super spreaders. The escalation in the complexity, size, and concentration of the financial system has spawned numerous super spreader institutions too big, too connected, or too important to fail. Too big to fail means too big. End of story. <laughs> and ironically, it was the ultra-conservative Chicago School of Economics, Milton Friedman, um, that first promoted, pro proposed nationalizing banks that were too big to regulate and that were anti-competitive. And in the UK, a commission is actually studying how to start to deconstruct that. Um, in the wake of the banking crisis, millions of people have moved their money to smaller local values-driven banks, such as those who formed the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. It's a new consortium of 19 of the world's leading sustainable banks whose decisions are based first on the needs of people and the environment. 
and a 2012 study by the Rockefeller Foundation compared the performance of 17 values-based banks against 29 banks considered too big to fail. The study shows unequivocally the sustainable values-based banks outperform traditional mainstream banks uh, in return on assets, growth in loans and deposits, and capital strength. The smaller banks delivered better returns. That's the actual data. Excuse me. <clears throat> the Global Alliance for Banking on Values, and you can Google that. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that, you know, if you want to get into it. Um, the Global Alliance for Banking on Values has set the goal of financing sustainable businesses that will impact one billion people by 2020. And that is the trajectory. It's actually on track to do that. 20 states are now studying how to create a state public bank based on the Bank of North Dakota, which I'm sure some, some of you are familiar with, a major success story. This publicly owned bank receives all state revenues to promote local commerce and industry, make student loans, and support new farmers. It was largely unaffected by the banking crisis. What a concept, a state bank for the common good. <laughs> um, business appears to be reaching a tipping point, and according to the MIT Sloan School of Management, two-thirds of companies are now turning to sustainability for a competitive edge and for higher profits. And for the first time in, in 2010, investment in renewables exceeded that in fossil fuels. Um, according to McKinsey and Company, the mainstream you know, um, consulting firm uh, and management firm, solar energy will come back strong after 2015, driven by the rapid spread of distributed energy with home solar and miniature community power stations in an end run around the utility industry. And Google has just capitalized two um, residential funds of 365 million a piece um, precisely to finance um, you know, rooftop solar basically and community power generation. The main innovation is financial, not technological. Long-term leases, not unlike a mortgage. So you will avoid the upfront capital costs. Meanwhile, this past November, Bill McKibben and 350.org and now Sierra Club launched a major um, camp movement um, to take on the fossil fuel industry um, that is a disinvestment campaign like the anti-apartheid campaign in South Africa. Um, to cut off the fossil fuel industry's financial and political support, including divesting our schools, churches, and government from fossil fuel investments. And that's on over 200 campuses now, I know. The big wheels are also turning at the Department of Defense. The DOD has embedded sustainability in its national security strategy. Remove the need for oil, and the reason for most of our wars goes away. Um, the vulnerability that we face at large, you know, four bridges go out on the Mississippi and New York City is hungry 48 hours later. Uh, the Pentagon is running scenarios on how do you move 150 million people off the U.S. coasts in the next 75 years because of climate change and rising sea levels. So um, look out, Telluride. <laughs> um, the DOD is moving away itself from fossil fuels and prioritizing the national decentralization of both energy and food infrastructures. Marine Colonel Mark, Mark Puck Mickleby, who just retired as Chief Strategic Assistant to the um, Chair of the Joint Chiefs, uh, puts it this way, the grand challenge is global unsustainability. National security and the bridge to resilience have just as much to do with food, water, and the built environment, transportation, education, health care, and the physical solvency of our nation as some bad guy sitting in a dark corner plotting whatever deed he's going to do. Um, when Colonel Mickleby, and we know him, he was at the Biden's conference last year, presented his new national security narrative of sustainability to the then chairman of the Joint Chiefs, um, Admiral Mullen, it said just one thing, 435, put a major military partnership sustainability project in every single congressional district. Um, as the world's biggest consumer of fossil fuels, the DOD has committed to generate 25% of its energy from renewables by 2025. It's opening up 16 million acres of land nationally, 13 million here in the West, um, that it controls for renewable energy development. Its goal is to create a boom of solar, wind, and geothermal projects, companies, and jobs, and to provide clean energy for its bases. Two of its bases, including I think maybe Fort Collins here in Colorado, have achieved the status of net zero facilities for energy, water, and waste. So I'm so curious how Rush Limbaugh is going to deal with the fact that the DOD is now a tree hugger. <laughs> That's going to get really fun. 
Um, most importantly, the DOD is funding cutting edge clean technology research and development just as it developed microprocessors, jet engines, GPS devices, and computers. It's using its market making leverage to ramp up tomorrow's clean energy industries. Meanwhile, opinion research shows a shifting political landscape, and this, the tipping point was Hurricane Sandy, hyper Hurricane Sandy. Americans overwhelmingly want action to address the threat of climate change and strongly support clean energy, and we're starting to see that in the White House now. But at the end of the day, our greatest resilience resides in community. Quite literally, social ties save lives. In Japan, the government sponsors small local festivals for people to meet each other because experience shows they'll be better prepared to weather disasters um, if they are connected with each other. Um, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, and Seattle are now following suit, and recently the Department of Homeland, Secur uh, Homeland Security funded a, su a successful three-year FEMA pilot to create what they call a whole community resilience system in eight cities for disaster prevention, which is soon going to then roll out nationally. If you can imagine, Department of Homeland Security and FEMA, whole community resilience system, amazing. As Sarah Cole said, the way we'll hold it together is to hold it together. The hardest thing to change in the system is the paradox to get back exactly what we're witnessing now. Emergence in an emergency, breakdown to breakthrough. Imagine catalyzing a massive shift to Los Angeles becoming a sustainable city by 2021. Imagine reworking the city using a functioning community forest model of an urban watershed to biomimic the forest as the pathway to sustainability in water, energy, air, and transportation. Imagine inspiring, engaging, and supporting a million people and families in changing their homes and neighborhoods to create the markets for change and the demand for policy change. Imagine everybody becoming a manager of the ecosystem. Imagine an integrated ecosystem management team, a board of chiefs among infrastructure agencies to create sustainability. Um, imagine having enough money by reallocating existing funds to rebuild the economy because of the jobs it creates and the money it saves. Imagine a community and multi-agency collaboration, bottom-up and top-down, to rapidly adapt LA before the crash. You don't have to imagine it. Andy Lipkus and Tree People are doing it as we speak in Los Angeles. Imagine a partnership between a college and its town to go carbon neutral by 2020. Imagine an agroforestry belt that can grow 70% of the community's food locally. Imagine combining these with an emerald green downtown redevelopment that models an economic driver for the whole region. Imagine leveraging the template of a town-gown partnership between the college and the town to mobilize the nation's 4,100 colleges and universities to become partners in their communities. You're imagining David Orr's Oberlin project, and $60 million is making it real right now. Imagine corporate rights elimination ordinances that give communities the right to refuse to recognize corporate constitutional rights at the municipal level. Imagine 142 communities comp uh, comprising over 350,000 people adopting them. Imagine Pittsburgh becoming the first major municipality to adopt a community bill of rights and enforce it by banning fracking and corporate rights within the city. The Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, led by Tom Lindsay and Mar Margill, is doing all this. Imagine a new model of development and how we organize our societies and economies to provide us with the things we need to live well. Food, energy, water, finance. Imagine a regional environmental bank that keeps the money in your region and gives loans to the people who grow your food. Imagine a forest fund that manages forests for timber, jobs, conservation, and carbon sequestration. Imagine it makes a financially attractive return. Imagine buying industrial forest land and growing trees for their own sake because they provide habitat and carbon sequestration and eventually bigger trees to sell in better markets. Imagine returns attractive to investors who see the value of storing wealth in natural capital and want to return to their kids and grandkids. Imagine disrupting our current institutions by giving people better choices. You're imagining EcoTrust and Spencer Beebe and Astrid Schultz who are doing it in the Pacific Northwest. Imagine proliferating these kinds of winning institutional innovations rapidly around the world. 
Imagine an infrastructure that takes these innovations and shortcuts them, getting all the world's social entrepreneurs like you access to capital and existing ideas more quickly. Imagine a global action network of resilient communities. In this time of no time, what we don't have is time. Can we dodge the point of no return by ramping up these emergent shadow systems quickly enough? As Naomi Klein wrote, the real solutions to the climate crisis are also our best hope of building a much more enlightened economic system, one that closes deep inequalities, strengthens and transforms the public sphere, generates plentiful, dignified work, and radically reigns in corporate power. It demands a new civilizational paradigm, one grounded not in dominance over nature, but in a respect for nature's cycles of renewal and acutely sensitive to natural limits. If you have a meaningful conversation with just about anyone these days, within minutes, the tears start to flow. We're all hurting badly. We're scared. We're suffering under chronic background levels of PTSD. In this time of no time, what we need to get past the wall of mirrors is a strong heart. Andy Lucas of Tree People puts it this way. I believe every single one of us has a scanner on board that's operating in our body that nature must have installed. It's our heart, and it's asking the question, where am I needed, how can I help? When something hits your frequency, it converts to adrenaline, a biochemical response. It might be a drip, it might be a shot. When we're given a shot of adrenaline, like when we see a car accident, it gives us the power to go help lift a car off the injured person. It looks like a miracle, but it's nature's gift to us. When the ecosystem is hurting, we get the drip. We're hardwired for this. The love that's there can sustain us. That's what really feeds us. I've come to believe that nature has adapted us, says Andy, to be its healers. It has raised us from being infants that were helpless to being brilliant, powerful, compassionate beings. We've got to take care of the mom, Earth, because she's given us everything to raise us to this point not so we can kill ourselves. Where am I needed? How can I help? Your heart will answer. You're big enough. We can do this. No one has ever before faced what we face today. We make the road by walking. It's an honor to walk this road with you. Thank you. So that's sort of my view of the bigger picture. There's obviously a lot more depth and detail we can go into on any parts of that. But what I thought I would talk to you is um, just for a few minutes, and then we'll get into a dialogue, um, is about the whole idea of too big not to bail systems. Um, the next five, six years are really this critical window, the ones of civilization window. Um, it's not just that I believe that. Um, there's an awful lot of data that confirms that, including the climate science. And, you know, Everything is happening bigger, faster than even the, the alarmists, you know, expected at this point. So we shouldn't kid ourselves. Um, Paul Gilding calls it the great disruption, and we're already in it now. Um, and so we can expect these kinds of systemic failures on a you know increasing and, and larger scale and a continuous basis. What's also emergent at the same time, um, especially at the local and regional level, is action. That you know, if you look at the lay of the land, that's really where the most progressive action is already happening. And in truth, we need to decentralize these too big not to fail systems anyway. It's the right thing to do, and it just works on every level to do that, um, from creating more localized economies to getting much more local distributed energy, obviously energy conservation, much more localized food systems. There's tremendous governance issues that arise because the feds can, of course, you know, trump local communities in many cases. And you know, there's always a balance. You can also bring up the Ku Klux Klan. Localization is not always a good thing. You know, it can be highly problematic. And ultimately, we live in an interconnected world. The local is connected to the regional, to the national, to the global. So we can't you know, pretend that that's not the case. Yet we know that this um, kind of descaling and decentralization is an absolutely necessary uh, trend that will only accelerate. So um, in, with Bioneer is in 2001, um, we, actually in 2000, a woman from Toronto came to us after the conference one year and said, I love coming to the Bioneer's conference, but I'm from Toronto and what I really want is to bring Bioneer's to my community. 
so each at that time each year we had um, several keynotes each morning on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And she said, why don't you beam those up by satellite and broadcast them to Toronto and I'll beam those in and organize a local conference around that with local speakers, local issues, you know, really bring it home and engage our community to help create community and focalize, you know, and surface solutions. Uh, we thought it was a great idea. So in 2001, we piloted this program called Beaming Bioneers. Um, and there were five sites in that first year and it proved to be a very elegant, wonderful model where people could really take the sort of um, you know, focus of binders and the framework of interdependence and of breakthrough solutions and diversity and you know, many virtues and values that, that are really the essence of what binders is about, and then customize that and adapt it to the local and, and bring out the local creativity and, and innovation. Um, in 2000, so last year we had 23 communities doing that in the U.S. with about probably 12,000 people participating at the local level. Um, the main conference in California, the Mothership, um, gets around 3,000 people a year. And then in 2006, we realized, um, well, we started a program called Dreaming New Mexico. And you know, I saw that we were talking all this localization stuff, but we were based in New Mexico, and I felt like we weren't walking the talk. And, you know, what can we do in our own community? So without going into any depth or detail about it, but I engaged a very brilliant, wonderful partner, Peter Warshall, um, who was one of the original editors of the Whole Earth Catalog and is kind of a polymath who has been a, a mayor and um, is an anthropologist, botanist, biologist, naturalist. Um, you know, he's a real polymath. Anyway, and brilliant systems thinker. And what we, the idea was, you know, dreaming the future. The year is 2020. You know, most of us all the time are stuck in these frontline struggles, just trying to stop all the destruction from happening and all the harm, whatever the next battle is going to be, you know, the next onslaught of destruction. And we don't step back to really ask, you know, not so much what can we settle for, what can we get, but what do we really, really want? I mean, what is the vision here? What is the dream? Because that's actually what propels all of us at the end of the day. And we need to be able to envision that dream. And that means you have to create the space to do it. It also means you have to know what current reality is, right? I mean, you can't, this isn't about a fantasy. This is about making real change and ultimately real transformation, which is different from change. You know, it's, you end up in a, like a, you know, a moth to a butterfly. It's not just change, it's transformation. Um, so what we did is it was a twofold process. One was an extremely rigorous, exhaustive research project to map the current reality of, of the state, first for energy systems and then for food systems. And the year is 2020, we've done everything right. What does the age of renewables look like in New Mexico? Or what does the age of local food sheds look like, right? And very practical and very engaged and covering all the different bases, the functional, technical, and, but also the political, cultural, you know, every, the, whole, the whole nine yards. Um, I won't go into any detail about that, but we, Peter created um, a visual map that was done by an artist for each of these, and then many, many technical maps. For example, no one had ever mapped solar energy or renewable energy resources in New Mexico. What do we actually have? No one had ever mapped environmental justice zones. You know, they were all just kind of isolated, disconnected, but nobody ever looked at the whole picture. Um, no one had ever mapped for, you know, you want to build an age of local food sheds? One of the big things for local economies is called LOIS, locally imported, um, I'm sorry, you know, yeah, locally owned and import substitution. You want a lot of local you know, ownership, but what are you importing that you don't need to be that you could be producing locally? That's a big economy right there. The first thing we discovered was there's only data about what you export from New Mexico. There were no data at all for what we import. You know, I mean, so there's huge gaps in, in the research and the thinking. It's not an easy process, in other words. And anyway, so we ended up engaging, um, you know, with the state and with the political system, and many good things happened as a result of that. But it was really revelatory uh, in how you sort of start to map your region and your place and look at it from a systemic point of view. And one thing led to another. And last year um, at the conference in California, we held a one-day intensive um, that was a call to action to start to build a, a, a network of resilient communities. And I want to say just a couple of things about that. And there's, you know, if people are interested, I have a lot more I could say about that. And we, we, um, we did a mapping process with a very interesting person named Scott Spann, um, who is an expert on systems thinking and has quite a bit of experience with networks. 
And what we're finding now is, you know, the 20th century was in many ways the century of the organization. And that included um, government initially, and then corporations. Um, what the problems that we face today, um, the crises that we face today, are so complex and so huge that they actually cannot be solved by the institutional structures that we currently have. Because you need interdisciplinary, team-based collaboration across multiple sectors. You need the stakeholders of business, government, civil society, academia, the citizenry. Everybody needs to be at the table. There are no institutions that actually do that. And there's a wonderful book that I really recommend if you're interested at all in this kind of thing called Global Action Networks by Steve Waddell. And over the last 20 years or so, several of these global action networks have arisen spontaneously that are multidisciplinary, multi, um, I mean, it's a much longer, I go into all the characteristics of them, but they take a fully systemic, holistic, and transformational view. And they have actually been quite successful in a relatively short period of time. Um, networks, I would add, are also nature's favorite form of organization. That's the way nature is set up, is through networks. First and foremost for communication, communications networks, and secondly, food and energy webs of different sorts. So this is an incredibly important emergent form right now. And so we've kind of come full cycle, which is the reason that I'm in Telluride right now, which is that we realized what was hiding in plain sight for us at Bioneers was this incredible network of the Beaming Bioneers communities, all of which are about building community resilience, which really is one of, you know, is a no-lose strategy going forward. You really can't lose when you build resilience from the ground up. It's not to say you don't also need a top-down strategy, but you gotta have the bottom up and it's fundamental. And with what's coming, the great disruption, and it's already here actually, um, is that we're all going to be compelled to become much more self-reliant and to take a lot more responsibility directly for our communities, for our lives, for building community, for building social ties. You know, every single study of communities that have survived crisis and disaster, the single biggest factor has been that people had social ties and were connected with each other. You know, it meant they kept coming back to the table because they knew how to relate to each other. It sounds so idiot simple, it's almost embarrassing. You know, think of native communities where this is the paradigm. Um, how do we relate to each other? But nobody's been doing this, you know? So that's what our interest is now, is, and that's why I'm so honored to be here to meet with Chris and Scott and the many people that I've had a chance, several people I've had a chance to meet already. Um, Betsy McKinney, who some of you knew, used to live here, was our sort of original entree into um, Tell You Why. I love Betsy, we're still very close with her. But this is where we think the trend is. We want to help build our little network into a, a very active network, um, provide good functional support, and then also really start to understand the successes that people are having. And I can give you some examples, and I'll close with this for now and open up the dialogue. But we're all facing very common challenges or areas that we need to address. And then, of course, each place is going to be individual and unique, be it the culture shed or the particular ecology. So you know, it's not cookie cutter in that way. But there's tremendous commonality. We're all going to be dealing with um, ener with, deal with energy conservation, really wrapping that up as quickly as possible, and with distributed energy, really you know, escalating that very quickly. We all need to move towards much more localized food systems and food economies. We all want to build much more local economies, period. And then we're all going to run into many of the same governance issues, whether it's corporate you know, rights trumping community decision making, or whether it's embedding the rights of nature, which is truly disruptive. Once you do that and people can stand as trustees on behalf of nature, it's a game changer. Or whether it's the functional level of literally legalizing sustainability because gray water is illegal, because building codes are you know, 19th century, um, all those kinds of issues that come up with mean literally legalizing sustainability. So we want to create a system where we can learn from each other, understand the successes, and start to circulate those because a lot of people are figuring out different pieces of the puzzle and, and other people are not hearing about it. You know, we could move this much more, as I said in the, in the earlier talk, it's not that we need more solutions. We need to rapidly spread and scale what we've already got. We've already got a lot. Um, so anyway, that, that's basically why I'm here. Um, and let, let's open it up for questions, conversation, whatever you'd like. Looks like it's you. <laughs> Chris, do you want to help me sure. over since I can't see people? <coughs> uh, one of the things that 
things that uh, occurs to me is that we already uh, here in Tory Rider are living in a community that uh, that uh, has a great deal of resilience and uh, is capable of building more of that resilience. How do we as moral people change some of the things that are happening elsewhere? I'm thinking specifically of an article I've read in the New York Times within the last month about how huge multinational corporations are buying large, large tracts of uh, land in uh, undeveloped areas, uh, Africa is a particular target, in which they own the land, they bring in their own labor force, and they export everything that's in there, leaving, you know, the, obviously the community is, uh, has gained some cash for the short term, but they have impoverished themselves from a resilience standpoint. How can we make a difference in something like that? Well, it's always great to start with an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what uh, the gentleman is referring to specifically is um, there has been a huge awakening related to climate change that agriculture is going to be massively impacted. And so China in particular is running all over the world now grabbing up farmland, including in Africa, and essentially bringing in their own people to do it and it's taking land off the table and, um, and exploiting the local populations. So um, I, I don't think there's an easy answer for that at all. I mean, China, in this case, it's not a corporation. Um, it's a sovereign nation. <laughs> Um, and so I think one thing is you want to build awareness about this clearly and you know communications media all that and oftentimes people you know, will coalesce or crystallize in a movement around this kind of thing but I think one of from my perspective part of the reality is we most of us I mean in a situation like that it's very hard to do something at the level of you know global power politics um, so I don't know I really don't know what you do about that there's a lot of movement in the um, venture capital world uh, to, to, like Jeremy Grantham, whom I mentioned, to try to resist things like that. But I don't have an answer for what you could do. I think what we can all do is deal with our place and certainly our country to the maximum that we can. I don't know, anybody else got any ideas? <laughs> Dan? Uh, yeah, one, one thing that we can do in some cases is refuse to buy the exports that, that uh, come from those places. So if, if they're, you know, taking a place and they're making eggs, you buy your eggs somewhere else. Or if they're making, growing tomatoes or, or whatever, you try to just, wherever you can, not buy those products. You know, it's interesting you bring that up because um, when we did this mapping process for the age of local food sheds in New Mexico, the, we changed the name of the project ultimately, or the name of the map, to the Age of Local Food Sheds and a Fair Trade State. And the reason was that number one, um, you can't go 100% of local food in Mexico unless you want to give up coffee and chocolate and mangoes and you know, all kinds of things that no way people are ever going to you know, forego. Um, and also, by trying to go 100% local, you would be displacing thousands of small farmers in Mexico for example, would be out of luck, that's it, out of business, you know, um, catastrophic for them. So you very quickly realize it's all connected. And so what we recommended, which I think was the first time this has come up, is that New Mexico adopt a policy of being a fair trade state. And that for all our food, we would trade only with other communities that share these, you know, have kindred values in this regard. And, and you actually create a deliberate policy system around that. That I think is one of the other responses that becomes, you know, that's what this gentleman is also in a sense referring to, things like boycotts. But they, you can take that to the next level of trying to really bring attention to what is fair trade in that way. The problem with China is that it is a sovereign nation, it's not a corporate thing, and it's not, it's a very opaque system. And that, that one is probably the toughest nut to crack of all. So um, we don't really have a lot of leverage. Firstly, setting the example and creating it here. I mean, China does watch what the US does. Uh, very Sorry. I said create the example um, here in, in the US, and then China does watch what the US does very intently. 
and um, she also though had is, is that uh, China in it of itself is is still coming out of its feudal system. I mean, it's still got half of its country left um, in its agrarian state, and so as that still grows, they're going to have to resolve some of their major issues very very quickly. And, uh, and even though um, the community change is, is ultimately the, the last fix, the, the state still has to deal with <coughs> some massive, massive problems in China right now. Pollution is one of them. You can't even go to Beijing anymore unless you want to get some sort of um, uh, uh, respiratory disease. So those sorts of issues, they're definitely watching the US and looking for their examples in China. Can I do it here first? Mm -hmm. Could people hear that sort of? Or? Thank you. Yeah, I was curious if you researched much on one people's public trust and the filings that have been done with the UCC as far as corporations. Um, what what did you share? What what you know? Well, um, these filings were were filed with the UCC, which is the Uniform Code that governs all governments. Um, all governments are corporations or registered corporations. It was never done with the public in the public trust. The public doesn't really know about it. And you have to file three times. And if it's not disputed, it becomes law. And they've been all filed. And now it's up to us to stand up and go, you no longer have any control over us. You are not a legal entity. It's, it's pretty profound. Yeah, you know, I think at large, the, the shift is hitting the fan. I mean, that's what it amounts to. And in some ways, we really need to widen our thinking and open up the much bigger possibilities than we've probably allowed for, particularly being in a very defensive mode for, for many years in that way. But these kinds of thoughts and models are spreading at the highest levels within the Defense Department and the corporate world. So, um, I, you know, I think bigger change, and then as things break down increasingly, you know, there's, I, I've never seen the kind of receptivity that I'm finding today, um, you know, among people. There's, you can really have a conversation now. It's not just immediate dismissal or, you know, kind of saying, forget that, that's not really gonna happen. People are saying that a whole lot less right now. So I think we need to open our thinking in, in that kind of a way. And, um, you know, one small story, but um, we, have been tracking a lot of the corporate rights issues for a long, long time since the early 90s and the evolution. And we were the first people to really kind of elevate Tom Lindsay, who I know some of you know his work, but um, and the work he's doing around at the local level, revoking corporate constitutional rights and then ultimately embedding the rights of nature in these 140 something communities around the country. So I got um, a friend of mine, Randy Hayes, who used to run, be the head of the Rainforest Action Network, to do one of Tom's democracy schools. And I knew it was really important that you do that to learn about this kind of work because RAM, Rainforest Action Network, takes on a lot of corporate you know, issues in that regard. So Randy got really excited about the work. He talked to our, our mutual friends at the Pachamama Alliance, who you may know, who do a great deal of work in Ecuador, particularly to helping to um, defend indigenous lands and rights, especially from you know, oil development. And long story short, through a daisy chain of connections, the rights of nature ended up in the, the national constitution of Ecuador, the first country in the world to invent these rights. I mean, that was not in my mind when I told Randy to go to a democracy school, you know? So you just have to really be open to the kind of shifts that can happen right now. And um, I think that, you know, we need to be very inclusive in that way and not assume that we're in a polarized, you know, dualistic situation. Um, bigger change is possible than probably we, we've imagined, you know? Um, you were talking about examples of resilient communities, that you had some, and I'd love to hear just some examples so that we would, so that if we were interested in doing this, we would have a direction, and, and maybe a s couple of suggestions that you might have, knowing our community, maybe some immediate steps that maybe some of us could take now to move us towards becoming more resilient. Sure. Um, well, you know, I referenced a few of the examples just at a superficial level, but what um, Andy Lipkis and Tree People have done in Los Angeles 
which, you know, I mean, LA is pretty much the poster child of, of, of you know, hopeless environmental devastation. And um, it, it's a very long saga over, I think Tree People's almost 40 years old now. They started in the, you know, about 40 years ago. But um, what they did was to engage this, well, let me give you one example. So they started out originally with really greening the city and tons of tree planting for obvious reasons. Um, Andy, as a boy of 15, started to develop asthma, you know, growing up in the horrifying smog that was LA in those years. His parents sent him to the mountains, you know, um, for the summer to, to a little camp. And he just fell in love with the forest and the trees. And then he learned that the smog of LA within 20 years was gonna kill this whole forest. And he freaked out at the age of 15. He started Tree People and ended up on Johnny Carson on late night TV. And the whole thing just exploded. And they spent a lot of years kind of greening neighborhoods, planting millions of trees, engaging kids, um, you know, all kinds of people. 20 years into it, they did kind of a self-evaluation and he did something incredibly courageous, which was said, you know, this isn't actually doing what, what we need. Um, it's kind of, you know, decorating the Titanic on some level. and. So they did a whole reanalysis, and what they did is they took the map of Los Angeles as we know it today, and it, it instead put the map of the original forest that was LA over that. And then what that really does is it, it's a mirror for the watershed, because that forest is only there because of the watershed. And then they looked at the current Los Angeles versus the original, or versus the watershed, and then they started to do what he calls acupuncture or acupressure tree planting. Um, they then scaled up, I'm sorry, hold on. Notice no plastic bottle. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no movie on it. Right, exactly. Thank you. Um, they then started a dialogue with the bureaucracy, with the infrastructure, and there's a department of water that spends $2 billion a year to pipe in water, right? There's a department of um, flood control that throws away a billion dollars of rainfall every year. They channel it out into Santa Monica Bay, right? Then there's a department of stormwater runoff and there's one of department of waste and nobody's talking to anybody. The department of waste, to, of sanitation, it turns out 40% of their so-called waste is green material, it's compost. It's incredibly valuable. So he started what became a 10 year process of bringing these people together as stakeholders to actually talk to each other. They did successive scaling up of physical demonstration projects to show, basically using permaculture techniques largely, to show how you could capture water on site, ultimately in an 8,000 person community, quite a large scale, and actually green the whole area, save the water, um, not need to import water, uh, green schoolyards, rip up asphalt, I mean, just endless benefits, engaging kids as watershed explorers, putting it in the curriculum, one thing after another, and just scaling and scaling and scaling it, and now essentially the whole, and they, what they showed ultimately through very rigorous economic analysis was that the money was already there. They have the money to make this change citywide on that scale if they reallocated. It was just being wasted and spent in the wrong places because it was a totally fragmented, incoherent approach, right? That was non-ecological. We built our cities before we understood ecology. So that's actually at the point now where this board of chiefs that I mentioned, having all the infrastructure agencies come together as one and co-design this resilient future, that also creates tons of jobs. I mean, the benefits are just endless. You know, we talk about unintended consequences and usually think we're, they're negative. When you have good design, the unintended consequences are positive. <laughs> what a concept, try flipping that model. So that's a really large scale example. What I mentioned with EcoTrust and the, the forestry bank, as well as the, this um, community bank for you know paying your farmers to grow your food. Um, those are very very real models. Um, David Orr and the Oberlin project. That's really uh, they've got all the money, they've got all the planning done, and they're launching that. And the idea is to then leverage that to get 4,100 colleges and universities to partner with their communities and build resilience. So. There's the, and then part of what we're doing now is precisely the question you're asking, starting to really look at least the communities we're connected with to understand where, where resilience is. And make no mistake, um, this is going mainstream in a big way, very quickly. So the city of Chicago um, is doing amazing stuff around climate adaptation, you know, from massive tree planting to water conservation, um, just right down the line. And it's straight from the mainstream of the city government. It's not a bunch of countercultural, you know, 
hippies and all the rest of it, you know, pushing on them or greenies, whatever the stereotypes are. Um, so I think that's exactly what we need now is this kind of database, you know, of, of what it means. There's also a book I recommend really highly called Resilience Thinking. Um, it's an alliance of biologists who came together around, and sociologists who came together around this. It's a very short, easy read, and it gives multiple case histories of communities that have precisely dealt with these kinds of resilience issues. So, and in terms of Telluride, you all know your region better than I do, so I'm very hesitant to say too much. But you know, I live just down the road in Santa Fe, same time zone, same mountains. Um, so we're facing many common issues in that way. But from our perspective, you know, clean energy has got to be a top priority, and energy conservation and efficiency, no matter where anybody is, that's really a big one. And um, McKinsey and, study, and company did this study that in 2015, distributed energy is really going to pop. And it's going to be home, you know, uh, your individual home, like, you know, solar rooftops. But it's also going to be very small scale neighborhood community generation. And, and the, there's now a very new company that will be at the Buyers Conference this year called Mosaic, which you can Google. And they're the first ones who crack the code on the economic system, the financial innovation that will make that happen. So literally you and your neighbors can get together and create a smaller community scale generation of clean energy that will supply all of you. And they've figured out the financial mechanism for that. And as I mentioned, Google has created two funds of 365 million apiece to push this. I mean, Google is so far out front on all this. They are not ExxonMobil. There are divisions in the corporate class. It is not monolithic in that regard. So that's going to absolutely pop. That is the future. It's an end run around the utilities, which have created these monopolies, which are very fossil fuel dependent, and they do not want to phase them out quickly. So this is an end run that actually could disrupt that entire industry. The utilities know it. They're scared. I mean, they're really scared. Um, so that, that's something that you know I think is doable, and I was talking with Chris and some other folks at lunch today about this, but um, you can make the, a really strong business case for this. It's just all good except for the utilities. I mean, there's nobody that doesn't benefit, including the McMansions and all the rest of it, you know? Um, so that's, that's a key thing. And then much more localized food system. That's a whole huge complex discussion, but if you want to look at some of the Dreaming New Mexico stuff, the map and the booklet on the age of local food shift, there's a huge amount of practical information there that I think would be totally applicable here in Telluride. Is that yeah. yeah, dreaminginmexico.org or the Binders website. And there's physical booklet and physical wall size map you can get too, but um, you have to order that. But. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> if, uh, all this green technology and everything is actually, in turn, entrepreneurial, you know, seeking profit. Aren't we really just fueling like the materialism and consumerism that got us in this boat in the first place? I mean, isn't that how China's buying Africa? Is everything's on the profit? You know, um, the the focus isn't the doing; it's the gaining. Could, could you say a little bit more? Well, like, you know, look, Google's throwing out uh, almost $700 million. Isn't that really just fuel, fueling the material and the consumerism that our society focuses on that's really degraded the environment in the first place? Uh-huh, uh-huh. No, I think it's a really, really, um, you know, core question. And I'm talking about priorities, basically, you know. I mean, that's just more people that can have a $300 phone bill. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you raise one of the gnarly questions. I mean, um, to me, it's not that growth is bad. The question is, what do you want to grow? You know? Um, and one of the most interesting kind of signals to me was um, during 9-1-1, you know, when New York City had just been bombed, and uh, George Bush showed up and told everybody to go shopping, you know? <laughs> and it could not have been more out of tune. Um, people were grieving, they were building shrines and altars and con connecting with people and um, being in that state. And it got people down to what our core values are. And as things degenerate here, we're, there's going to be a lot of suffering. I mean, that's inevitable now, unfortunately, and a lot of dislocation. And I think what's happening is we're being called to come to what our core values are. 
And the truth is, it's not about stuff. It's about each other. It's about nature. You know, those are the things at the end of the day to most people that really matter. <coughs> so what you're really talking about here is a value shift in that regard. And um, one of my mentors, a, a man named, uh, who's an Iroquois elder named John Bohawk, talked about this a lot, and it's in the Dreaming the Future book, um, a quote from him about this, but he said, in a lot of ways, the fundamental breakdown is when we stopped seeing a tree as a tree and started to see it as board feet. You know, we start to commodify everything. And, you know, there's all these studies now to do with the Global Happiness Index that came out of um, Bhutan, the Gross National Happiness Index, that materialism is, is one important factor. You don't want to be hungry, you want to have shelter, and you want to be eating enough. But beyond that, more stuff doesn't make you more happy. In fact, the most developed you know, consumerist materialist economies are the ones with the highest degree of unhappiness and depression and suicide and violence. I mean, the list goes on and on. And you, know, you go to a place like Europe, and there's such a better balance between the commons, between the social sphere. People take time for meals. They have long dinners. They have family connections, community events. I mean, that's really so. But that's a core thing as a society that I think we're being called to confront now: is what do we really value? What do we really want? Um, and so I think you know that that's kind of what you're asking. But you know, there's a case to be made that um, we could create as much stuff as we're now creating and do it ecologically, do it in a green manner, and not actually destroy the, the resource base and all the rest of it or the climate. But if we could do that, let's say we could. Is that the world we want to live in? You know, so that's up to us. I mean, nobody else is forcing that on us in any way. I think those are the choices that we have to come to. It's really about a value shift, you know, fundamentally to me. I mean, that's my perspective on it. Does that make sense? I was just going to add a little bit about what you brought about Google and its investment um, into uh, distributed energy systems. Uh, what's happening is that. Um, you're taking the centralized aspect that control of electrons, the extent of the lines, and you're sending it to people. But you, get, but you have to change that economic forum. That's, and besides having, like you're saying, Jose is bringing this about. Um, but what it's doing is, like, yeah, it's taking away that creation of energy and creating it on site. A lot of people to see how it's created as well. There's a lot of things that are going to happen in that shift is that it's going to be in their backyard. It's not going to have this overbearingness that it once did, so I think that'll, that's why it's going to change. And I think Google's perspective is not to want to control anything. They're just trying to reset up systems. It's about redirecting how the system is created and how we're able to use it better, Re making it new systematic. It's all about that. And their input is how to make that design happen, how that people have more power, literally and figuratively, in their yards, in their, in their hands. So I think intent is anything other than trying to create something that way. And they realize that they have this ability to do so. It's just like they have to you know, other things they've done. Um, giving, giving new perspectives on things. So. Yeah, could people hear okay? More or less? Or? <laughs> okay. Um, he was saying that he felt that Google's intent was not you know, controlling or negative in that way, that it was really to, in effect, empower people to become much more independent from an energy perspective. And we actually had the opportunity, we were doing some of the Dreaming New Mexico energy mapping to meet with some of the higher ups at Google, and they were just beginning to kind of understand some of this stuff. And um, I don't think that they're insincere at all. In fact, they just partnered with another financial group a couple of years ago, three years ago, to build a pipeline under sea um, on the east coast, an electricity line um, that will enable wind power in, to um, offshore wind to go to many, many local communities um, up and down the east coast. So it's actually enabling distributed energy. The question that arises in this situation is more that um, you know you have these giant corporations who are going to make impossible amounts of money. Wealth becomes more concentrated. That in itself is a problem. Um, so, you know, that's more of the problem. It's not that they're, you know, have bad intent or, or, or not even doing good things. I mean, they are doing really, really good things, in my opinion, in this area. The question is the whole system that we have that concentrates wealth and allows that to be the case. So that, that creates a whole other set of questions and issues and how you challenge that system and that degree of power, you know, which comes from concentration of wealth is a whole other discussion. But, um, 
you know, one of our, um, another person we had at the Biden's conference last year, um, Gar Alperowitz, whose name you may know, who's done a tremendous amount of great work on localized economies and uh, democratic, uh, the, the politics of democracy. They just innovated a really cool model in Cleveland um, called the Evergreen Cooperative, which I think you can um, Google. But the issue is, in many ways, the concentration of wealth and then the dis disproportionate power that comes from that. So how do we democratize wealth and access to capital? That's a really practical question that we all have to deal with. And that's what this company Mosaic is doing in this clean energy area in terms of, of you know, distributed energy at the neighborhood level. But what they did in Cleveland is um, they realized in order to create sustainable local businesses over time, what you've got to have is a continuum and constancy over a long period of time. Right? It's at least a decade, say, to get started, because it takes that long to really incubate and you know, launch something. So what they did is they went to the, several of the large local hospitals and the universities there. And they said, if we can put together these various different forms of locally owned companies of different sorts, from cooperatives to worker-owned you know, profit-making enterprises, um, would you be a long-term client? And so the first company was a green cleaning company that was all um, low-income, multicultural folks who would you know, be the owners of this company, essentially, themselves. Um, and so anyway, these institutions committed to 10-year contracts, right? And then the next thing was a local energy company along exactly the same kind of a model. So in other words, for one thing, um, the company is not going to leave. These are all local institutions that are there to stay. They're going to be there in 10 years, colleges and hospitals, right? The jobs are not going to get outsourced if the company leaves. And, they, and the workers can actually own them, whatever the specific business structure is. So you, they're actually building wealth among, uh, through ownership, which is a really different model from what most of us, you know, what we all deal with now. So that kind of model is already starting to spread, and there's, you know, sort of capitalism 2.0 is, is erupting all over the world now with things like B Corps, and there's so many models coming out that you can't even keep up anymore. Uh, but that, I think, is one of the really key things, and of course it relates to local economies, and what does it mean to build a local economy? So it's not just doing more locally, it's about how that, you know, who has access to capital and how wealth is shared in that way. And again, I think, you know, we can't be kind of just blaming this all on the system and all that. We also have to take responsibility for creating the alternative here and saying, these are the terms of engagement, this is how we want to do business now, and start to really deconstruct this concentration of wealth. So we've got just a little bit more time. Um, uh, Daniel gets the last question. I encourage you to sign up for EcoAction newsletter, Fiona and Sophia in the back there. Also our EcoAction initiative, which is a way to help reduce your carbon footprint, understand the amount of energy you're using. You know, you work with a mentor who will go through and, and give you some tips on how to save energy and buy local and you know, become part of this network. And also, so tomorrow morning at 8.30 at the Palm, we'll have another sort of presentation and a lot of time for Q&A. We're going to have two student groups come in, so I encourage you to come to that. And the other reason to sign up for the newsletter is we do want to follow up and follow through. Some of these things that EcoAction Partners is already working on, we have a big push that we want to do on local food and um, how to connect the basically the whole western slope. There's groups working in the Cortez Montezuma County, there's groups working in Montrose, and there's a really great opportunity there so please sign up and watch for um, these follow-up follow discussions because it's not just the discussion, it's then how do we act? Because it's, it's not up to me and it's not up to you, it's up to all of us to be doing pretty much everything we can to, you know, to create the resilient communities that we want and to create the future that we're dreaming about and, and make those heartfelt connections. So, um, Daniel. My question is about uh, Dreaming in Mexico, and when you were all going through the process, what experiences did you have when you encountered adversaries or different philosophies, maybe even you know mistrust, or um, you know to really make something happen fast and on uh, a larger scale, like many different groups come together. So I'm just curious what your experience was and how you all dealt with that. Great question, and a major you know, question that we had to face ourselves. So we had two different approaches. Um, Danilo Meadows, the late Danilo Meadows, who was a brilliant systems thinker and wrote a lot about system thinking, said that the hardest thing to change in a system is the paradigm. 
and that what you want to do is to really elevate the vision and the voices of the champions of the new paradigm. You basically want to completely ignore the old guard, you just not give them any airtime at all. So in general, our approach was to look for those people at every level within the systems, including in the political and financial systems, and to really try to work with them because they were going to be the beacons and the lighthouses for what was emerging already. And in that regard, we had good fortune for a period of time because Governor Bill Richardson was, you know, of course a mixed bag, but he was very progressive, particularly on clean energy, um, and wanted to move in that direction. So we had a lot of allies for that reason. There was tremendous openness, and particularly because we'd really done the research and the, you know, the, the mapping process, you know, quite exhaustively. They respected the analytical nature of the kind of work we were presenting, and there were, you know, very clear. One example was there was a big question as to whether to build a transmission line along south, the um, east-west in southern New Mexico, which is where a lot of the renewable energy is. Um, and there was resistance to that, and our mapping showed that it was also a huge geothermal belt, which meant that they couldn't complain that what if the sun don't shine and the wind don't blow, and we're all going to be freezing in the dark, you know? And we said, actually, the geothermal could balance that load all the time, and that ended up tipping that decision. However, we also decided deliberately to not engage with people who under no scenario could become an ally or were in any way open to that. An example of that was the Cattlemen's Association. I mean, they were utterly hardcore in their view and their interest, and there was no way that they were going to shift. So we simply did not relate to them. We ignored them completely and did all of our work around them, in effect. And so, you know, you, there are many ways to come at this, um, but that, that was the way that we chose in, in that case. Great, so I'll make one last shameless plug for a uh, permaculture design course the, through the University Centers of San Miguel, happening starting July 20th. There's three of the five teachers here, Daniel, myself, and Robin. So if you want to learn about systems and regenerative systems and a whole lot of more awesome and great information in a local setting, um, check out ucsanmiguel.org for the information on how you can sign up for that. And we're lucky enough we're going to have three scholarships for um, high schoolers this year, so we're really excited to engage multi-generationally. Um, and again, we're going to go across the street to between the covers for a book signing. I hope to see some of you tomorrow morning um, or tomorrow night in which way. And Chris, one more, a couple more sh shameless plugs yeah, for me too. Um, one is that I'm real serious about why I'm here in terms of the purpose of wanting to really support the BB Bioneers community here and work on these issues with you of community resilience and help get you connected to other communities around the country. So that's an ongoing process. Um, you know, we really would like to engage ongoing and get your feedback. And I'm really happy and grateful for all the great work Scott and company are doing at the library. So we're already conspiring about a number of different strategies. Plus, plus pioneers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and um, we'd love to have you all at the national conference this year, and we want to have a, an actual formal reception or a meeting for all the local communities that are part of the Phoebe Binders Network. So we'd love to just create the conditions where you can start getting connected around the country. And uh, I mean, people are doing amazing stuff. I could, I should have actually given you some other. Well, do I have just two more minutes? Okay. So here's the daisy chain. Um, probably the, the most advanced community in the Beaming Network is um, New Bedford, Massachusetts. And um, they, so I'll compress the story greatly, but we helped introduce them to Van Jones, who I'm sure you know of, and um, Majora Carter, who ran um, Sustainable South Bronx uh, in New York City for many years, who are really two of the great visionary leaders around green jobs um, and, and so forth. So through that connection, they organized a meeting with Mayor Scott Lang of New Bedford. And he really got it, that by doing energy conservation and housing retrofitting for that reason, you know, efficiency stuff, just going back and retrofitting houses and you know, creating energy efficiency, that they could both save a lot of money and create a lot of local good jobs in underserved communities. So that went so well that they ended up getting a $300,000 grant from the National Conference of Mayors to really pilot that project. The city of New Bedford, excuse me, is now actually funding the program because it's saving so much money and there are 23 local groups in the region all focused on that. I mean, just that, and that's just one example of what they've done. 
Then um, what happened was Cape Wind, which you're probably familiar with, the first large-scale offshore wind development, which one of our board members, Greg Watson, helped to use kind of a spark plug for that. We had to, it was the first one to get federal approval, really complicated, difficult process. Um, they, they finally did that. As a result of that, the Port of New Bedford, which is a former whaling port, I mean, totally decrepit, 19th century, old and in the way, New Bedford is now going to become the port of entry for Cape Wind, which is a huge economic benefit and a huge benefit for the whole region and tremendous source of pride that they're going to be at the forefront of clean energy. And so we didn't do this stuff. I take no credit at all. I mean, we helped support them. We gave them the framework of pioneers and you know, helped make some connections. And they did all the rest of this. And we're going to be arranging teleconferences later in the year for them to share exactly how they went about this. So you can get a really you know, blow by blow account of what they went through, the challenges they faced, and, you know, how it came together. <clears throat> and that kind of thing can I, can I think you know, really, really spread quickly. When is the Bioneers Conference this year? Uh, let's see, it's, I think it's October 18th to 20th um, in, in Marin, and I believe that there's talk about actually organizing a bus to go out there. Um, so we would love to have you all participate and get connected. And um, the last thing I want to say is just the, this book that um, I'll be signing across the street. Um, it's, it's a book of essays, so it's a very easy read. Um, I decided to take all this sort of stuff I've been writing for five years over about the last decade and um, just to have to see what was there. And it ended up being a good representation of what I've learned over about the last 10 years. The beauty for me of five years in a very selfish way is that I get to sit at the knee of all these amazing, brilliant innovators in all kinds of ways and just learn what they do and pick their brains. And, you know, it's been like a permanent graduate school in the best sense, except in the real world, you know, operative. And so I'm enormously grateful to all these mentors and, and people. But that's really what the book is. And, you know, Chris can tell you whether she's just read it and all that. But um, anyway, I hope you'll have a look at it. And um, my daughter helped me edit it, or it did not exist. I couldn't face going through all my own materials. So <laughs> thank goodness for Ramona. But <laughs> anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, it's such a joy to hear what you're all doing here and great questions and comments. And I look forward to seeing you again and bringing Nina back next time. So thanks to Lucy and the Nugget Theater, and we're just going to go right across the